All right, folks, we'll get started. Uh, this week we have module 10. There's two homework sections and a practice writing assignment. All right, so hopefully Friday we'll have time to work on the practice writing assignment together. We'll see. Um, first thing we want to look at, though, is here's a simple question. If I leave port and I go north for 10 miles, and I take a 20-degree turn and I go 8 miles, how far away am I from the port? It's a real simple question, right? Well, let's let's see what we got here. If we start labeling this stuff, if I call this angle here alpha, and I call this angle beta, I call this angle gamma. Let's see. The side off opposite alpha would be a. The side off opposite beta would be b. And the side opposite gamma would be c. So let's write down what we know here. Uh, a is eight. Uh, we want to find out what B is. That's specifically what we're looking for. Okay. Um, I don't know what alpha is. Uh, beta, I know what beta is. From here to here is 180 degrees. So 180 minus 20 would be 160 degrees. And let's see, C is 10. And we don't know what gamma is. All right, so this is a simple question, right? We're going to go 10 miles, then 8 miles. We know the angle we turn. We want to know how far away we are. Well, if we look at this, you can't use the law of signs. Because you look at this, you're like, I only have two pieces out of the four. I only have two pieces of information out of the four. And here I only have two out of the four. Well, that sucks, right? I can't use the law of signs. So this simple question, we can't answer with any of the mechanics that we've developed, right? Of course, we could dig into this. We could be like, well, a triangle is really just two right triangles, isn't it? So we could just we could like break this into two right triangles and figure out the answer. Well, if we're going to do this once, we may as well do it generically so that we can get a formula that we can use for any problem like this, right? Let's not waste our time breaking things into two right triangles and all that just to solve one problem. Let's do it generically so we can come up with a formula that applies to any problem like this, right? And we're going to call it the law of cosines, okay? So let's draw a triangle here. Here's a random triangle. Um, I'm going to call this alpha. The book calls it theta. Let's call it alpha, right? Right, because it's the side opposite A. So I'm just drawing something generic here, all right? But this is a random uh, triangle. Um, what I want to do is get an uh, equation going on here. So what I'm looking at is I see here's a right triangle and here's a right triangle. That's where my trig applies. That's where the Pythagorean theorem applies, right? But in order to talk about this triangle, I need a name for this side, right? Right now, this has a name, okay? So I'm going to call this whole side, I'm going to call it X just so that I can refer to it because I want to talk about this angle and this side. And this triangle here, if, since I've named this X and this is C, now this has a name, right? Because I need to be able to refer to the sides of the right triangles. So by introducing this letter X, this has a name and this has a name. Of course, in my equation, when I come up with a formula, I don't want any X's in it. I want A's and B's and C's in it. All right, but that's okay. We'll get rid of the X later. And for this right triangle here, I, I need a name for this, so I'll call it Y, right, just so that I can refer to that. So let's look at the big triangle. Now we're trying to get the information from the blue triangle involved, right? So if I look at this angle here, I could say that cosine of that angle is adjacent over hypotenuse. So adjacent is X, the hypotenuse is B. Okay. And the other thing I know about this angle is that sine of it is going to be the opposite over hypotenuse. And it's okay that we have X's and Y's. Uh, this tells me that X is B cosine alpha. This tells me that Y is B sine alpha. Okay. So that's the information I got from this triangle. Now let's look at this triangle. The important thing here is that this, this A here, right? This is part of this guy, right? But it's, uh, 
it's also part of this guy. Okay, the other thing that it's shared is this side is part of that, right? It's part of the whole thing. And this thing here, this, basically this side is gonna tie these two triangles together. The information gets intertwined there, okay? Because of this. So let's look at the little triangle. I don't know what this angle is. I don't know what that angle is. They're arbitrary. What I do know is the Pythagorean theorem applies. I know that this side squared plus this side squared is equal to this side squared, okay? So this is what I know. Just by looking at it and looking at the right triangles, this is what I can write down. But what I want is an equation that's talking about this guy, not the right triangles. I'm concerned about this guy. I'm concerned about A, Bs, and Cs, and alpha, right? I want a formula that has A, B, C, and alpha in it. Not X's and Y's. X's and Y's were just letters I threw in so that I could refer to these sides. Luckily, we can get rid of X and we can get rid of Y in favor of B's and alpha's, okay? So if we substitute that into the Pythagorean theorem here, we got A squared is, let's see, X is B cosine alpha. And then Y is B sine alpha. All right, now I have a formula that's only referring to an angle in my triangle, right? This triangle of interest, I'm referring to an angle and it's three sides. So this is a good formula. It's only referring to the parts of my triangle, not other extra stuff. Well, let's see if I can simplify this a little bit, okay? Um, if I square this dude out, I'm gonna get a B squared cosine squared minus two BC plus C squared, B squared. And if I replace this sine squared with a one minus cosine squared, which I'm tempted to do because I'm gonna get a B cosine squared. Here I have a B cosine squared. Maybe those will go away, right? If I distribute this B squared through here, multiply everything by a B squared so I can get rid of these parentheses. Now I can look at it and go, oh, all right, that goes away. So um, what I have here is A squared. I'm gonna write these first, right? Because they're positive. And then this negative part, I'm gonna write second. And I am missing a cosine here. Two BC cosine alpha, right? when I multiply those together and multiply by two. So I have a two BC cosine alpha. Now this looks a lot better, all right? I have A's and B's and C's and alphas. Those are parts of the triangle of interest. There's only cosine in it, right? This is called the law of cosine, okay? Now we can write it three different ways, right? This is the one that we solved. But the thing is, is there's no special sides to a, a random triangle. I could call this A, B, C, or I could have called this A and this B and this C, right? There's no special side to a random triangle, okay? A right triangle, uh, C has to be C. C is special, it's the hypotenuse, right? I could have called this B and I could have called that A and it wouldn't have made any difference, okay? All right, so, but for a generic triangle, the sides aren't special. So when I write this here, as long as this angle is the side that's opposite, is the angle that's opposite that side, right? These are the same equation, right? Beta B squared, gamma C squared. These two are the, not that one. These two are not that one. These two are not that one. These sides, or that, these are, so it's the same thing. It's the same pattern, right? If you have this, you get these just by relabeling the triangle, okay? So these are all the same, they're all the same formula. Now, what I want you to notice is that if alpha is pi over two, cosine of pi over two is zero, right? So if this angle is pi over two, you're getting the Pythagorean theorem, all right? This is, this is also a generalized Pythagorean theorem is what it is. 
It's the Pythagorean theorem applied to non-right triangles, right? So it's not just the Pythagorean theorem. You have a little bit of correction here, right? So it applies to any triangle. So this is really cool. Like you, you notice we use the Pythagorean theorem like constantly, right? Well, now we have a generalized version of it, also known as the law of cosine. So it's a very powerful theorem. So knowing that, if I go back up to this guy, you know, it's like, we want to figure out what B is. I know what this and this are. I can look at this and say, well, I can't use the law of sine, but I have beta. I want B. I could be like, well, B squared is A squared plus C squared minus 2AC cosine beta. And I know what A is. I know what C is. And I know what beta is. I just plug them in, right? That means that B is simply the square root of that stuff. Plug in the numbers and you have the answer. All right. So instead of just breaking this into right triangles and doing trig all day and just getting the answer to this one problem, we did it generically and we came up with a formula that now we can apply to any problem. And that's how you want to approach life, right? It's like you could do it this thing just specifically for this one task but if you back up and you think about it it's like I might end up having to do things like this over and over again in my life so maybe I should make a generalized plan of attack that I could reuse okay so how does this work well basically if you can't use the law of sine you use the law of cosine so look at a problem here Okay, one thing I might point out up here, though, is we have a side, an angle, and a side. This is a side, angle, side situation. I can never remember those. We have angle, angle, side, angle, side, angle, all those, right? I never know which one's which. I don't pay attention to that. I just write down the information I'm given, and then I look at it and go, I can't use the law of sines, so I got to use the law of cosines. So look at this one. What do we have? Uh, A is 10. We don't know what alpha is. We don't know what B is. Beta is 30 degrees. C is 12, and we don't know gamma. So if I look at this, I write this down, and I'm like, two out of four, can't use the law of sine. Two out of four, can't use the law of sine. Two out of four, I can't use the law of sine. I have to use the law of cosine. So since I know beta, I'm going to try to get B. B is A squared plus C squared minus 2AC cosine beta. So I take the square root of both sides. I know A, I know C, and I know beta. Plug those in, and you're going to get a number. All right? I'm not going to waste time plugging numbers in and fiddling with my calculator. Y'all can do that on your own. I'm going to teach you the math, right? So that's how you get B. Now that you know what B is, now you have three out of four. I can use the law of signs now. I can use the law of signs to get alpha. I could be like, okay, uh, sine alpha over A is sine beta over B. So A is A sine beta over B. So alpha is sine inverse of this. And I know A, it was given. I know beta, it was given. And I know B, I figured it out using the law of cosine. Plug those in, and you get a number. That's your angle. All right. So we use the law of cosines first, then we use the law of sines. But you might be asking here, what about the ambiguity, right? We used to go, this is theta one, uh, alpha 1. What about alpha 2? Is there a second triangle? Right? Remember the ambiguous case? Okay, well, look, all three sides are fixed. If all three sides are fixed, there cannot be a second triangle. There is no second triangle that has the same three sides. Does that make sense? You can't have a second triangle. Those are the three sides, right? The ambiguous case was like this. If you had uh, another side, you could prop it like that, or you could prop it like that, right? Well, if you propped it like that, you had a length like this, but if you prop this side over here, you had a different length, right? The lengths had to change. All three sides are fixed. You can't have the, there is no ambiguity. There is no, 
There is no second possible alpha here. All right. And once you know the two angles, you get the third because they add up to 180 degrees. And you're done. Does that make sense? So first, look and see, can you use the law of sines? If not, use the law of cosines. It's that easy. All right. No ambiguity. No two triangle situation. None of that. All right, here's one. Let's let's see what we got. Um, we don't know A. Alpha is 30 degrees. We have a B. We don't know beta. We have a C. We don't know gamma. So again, two out of four, two out of four, two out of four. We can't use the law of sines here. You need three out of four, right? So... Let's see, I have alpha and I have the other sides. I can get A. A squared is B squared plus C squared minus 2BC cosine alpha. So A is the square root of that. We have the B, we have the C, we have the alpha. Plug those in and you're going to get a number. Boom, we have that side. All right, so now we can use the law of sines. We can be like, okay. Uh, or you could use the law of cosines, couldn't you? Let's see. Yeah, if you wanted to, you could use the law of sines or the law of cosines here. Right, to get beta. Because the thing about these, check, check out this law of cosines here. If I know three sides, I can solve for the angle, right? So you, let's, uh, let's say I had three sides and I wanted the angle. Let's see, we could, uh, I would have minus 2BC cosine alpha. I'll just move this to the other side. So I'd have A squared minus B squared minus C squared. If I divide by that, this looks goofy. I don't like this minus sign being on the bottom. If I bring it up, those become positive and that becomes negative. I would have B squared plus C squared minus A squared over 2BC. All right, so this is just this. All I did was solve for cosine. You want to use it in this way if you had three sides and you wanted the angle. You could rearrange these others in the same way. Cosine beta would be A squared plus C squared minus B squared, right? You're subtracting the side opposite that angle over 2. A and C, or the last one, if you solve, solve for this guy, you would have A squared plus B squared minus C squared over 2AB, right? So these are just this where you've solved for this, okay? So here I could use the law of sines to get beta. I could be like sine beta over B equals sine alpha over A, so sine beta, bring the B over. So beta is sine inverse of this stuff. You could do that to get beta. Or I could use the fact that cosine of beta is A squared plus C squared minus B squared over 2AC. So beta is cosine inverse of this stuff. You do it either way, all right? Once you have four pieces of information, you can use either the law of sines or the law of cosines. You can use either one. It's when you only have three pieces of information that you're restricted, right? So these are gonna give you the same thing. Call it whatever, number two, right? Once you have two angles, you get the third because they add up to 180 degrees, okay? So you start off with three pieces of information. If you can't use the law of sines, then use the law of cosines. After that, you'll have four pieces of information. And after that, you can do whatever you want. Like to get this, I could use the law of cosines to get this, but it's easier to say, well, the angles add up to 180 degrees, right? I could, right here, I could use the law of sines to get gamma. I could use, uh, the law of cosines to get gamma, 
But at this point, just use the fact that they add up to 180 degrees to get gamma, right? The more information you have, the more flexibility you got. Does that make sense? All right. Let's look at another one here. Here we go. Here's a side, side, side situation. This is where they give you three sides and you got to use, find the angle, okay? So we have A is 20, we don't know alpha. We have B is 25, we don't know beta. And we have C is 18, we don't know gamma. Side, side situation, you can't use the law of signs. I have two out of four, two out of four, and two out of four. Can't use the law of signs. So pick an angle, any angle. You can use the law of cosines to, to solve any angle you want. I could be like, well, cosine alpha is C squared plus C squared minus A squared over 2BC. So alpha is cosine inverse of this stuff. We know all those pieces of information, so we get a number, right? Now that we have an angle, we can use the law of sines to get beta, or we could use the law of cosines to get beta, because we have all these. Either way, whichever way you want it. Cosine beta would be a squared plus c squared minus b squared over 2ac. So beta would be cosine inverse of this stuff. So you could get beta that way. Or you could use the law of sines here. You could be like, well, sine beta over B equals sine alpha over A. Bring my B over. So beta is sine inverse of this stuff. You can get the same answer. You can use whichever one you're more comfortable with. Right, because we have four pieces of information, and that'll give you this. At this point, these add up to 180 degrees, so you know what gamma is. The following, I don't want to plug numbers in because I don't think that's very helpful to y'all. It's like, here's the math, and now watch me fiddle with my calculator for 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't see that being very useful. Okay. Uh, plus, that's in the book, right? See, all of that stuff, I think all of this stuff just obfuscates what you're trying to learn. Uh, here we go, try it number two. Let's see what this one is. Here's another three side situation. A equals five, B equals seven, C equals 10. We have all three sides. We need to find alpha, beta, and gamma. All right, pick an angle, pick any one of them you want. If I wanted gamma, I'd be like, well, cosine of gamma is a squared plus b squared minus c squared, c goes with the gamma, over 2ab. So gamma is cosine inverse of this stuff. You know all these, you know the a, b, and the c, you're just plugging them in, plug them into your calculator and you get a number. Okay. If I wanted beta, I could be like, well, cosine of beta is a squared plus c squared minus b squared over 2ac. So beta is going to be cosine inverse of this stuff. And I know a, b, and c. All right, so boom, I have that. So these add up to 180 degrees. So now I have alpha. I mean, you could do it the long way. You could be like, I'm going to do it the long way. Cosine of alpha would be b squared plus c squared minus a squared over 2bc. So alpha is cosine inverse of all of this stuff. If you wanted to do it the long way, right? But again, at this point, this guy is 180 minus these other two angles. That's, that's a lot faster, right? Subtract. Any questions? Okay. So, so far, it's just plug and chug, right? Here's the formula. This problem here, I don't like. I finally figured it out, but these word problems, I always have issues with them. On many cell phones with GPS, an approximate location will be given before the GPS signal is received. 
This is accomplished through a process called triangulation. All right, and we're going to make a triangle, which works by using the distances from two known points. Suppose there are two cell phone towers with range, within range of a cell phone. The two towers are located 6,000 feet apart along a straight highway. Okay. 6,000 feet apart. The highway is running east to west. The well, first off, if the highway runs east to west, doesn't, always, doesn't it also run west to east? Does that, the highways go both ways usually? They say east to west specifically, though. And they say the cell phone is north of the highway. So I'm going to put C for cell phone. Based on the delay, it could be determined that the signal is 5,050 feet from the first tower. Well, I'm going to call this A and I'm going to call this B because they said the highway runs east to west. So if we're talking about things going east to west, I will call this the first tower because like, what do they mean by the first tower? Right? I don't know what that is. The first tower, there are just towers. There's no first tower. But if you're going to say east to west, that okay, I'll call that the first tower. They say uh, the cell phone is 5,050 feet away from the first tower and 2420 from the second tower. So that's more accurate. This should be longer than that one, right? But then they say, determine the position of the cell phone north and east of the first tower. Well, if I call this the first tower, the cell phone is not northeast, it's northwest, right? So I drew the triangle wrong. I picked the wrong thing to be the first, the first tower. So what they must mean is this. This is the first one. This is the second one. There's the cell signal. This is 50, 50. This is 24, 20. And this is 6,000, the mirror image of it. Because then if this is the first tower, then the cell phone is northeast. All right. So it would be great if they gave us a picture in this problem, right? So they don't mean this, they mean this. Okay. This is what we're looking at. That's what they want to know. Find the location of the cell tower that's north and uh I'm gonna just put like make this blue. Okay, so put that, there's my first tower. They want to know the location of this that's north and east. Well, this is an XY coordinate, right? So they want to know what is that coordinate? Well, if they want to know what that coordinate is, really, we want to know what this and this are, right? The XY coordinate. So what we're really looking at is this right triangle. That's what we need to find out. So how does what we've learned apply to this, right? Well, this is useful, right? This guy right here, that's the hypotenuse. If I only knew this angle, right? If I only knew what that angle was, because cosine of that angle is adjacent over hypotenuse, right? That means that the X would be 50-50 cosine theta. And the Y, right, sine of that theta would be 50, would be Y over 50-50, our basic trig definitions, right? So Y would be 50-50 sine theta. So if I just knew what this angle was, I could figure out what those are, right? These are your basic trig definitions, what cosine and sine are. You're trying to figure out what this is. I would look at this triangle and be like, if I knew what theta was, right, those trig definitions, cosine theta, there's three pieces of information in your trig definitions, right? There's two sides of a triangle and an angle, right? I got one side. If I got the angle, I could figure out the other side. So to figure out what theta is, I would use the law of cosines. It'd be like, well, cosine of that angle, uh, and I'm going to call it alpha since that's side A, because then it's easier for me to remember what's going on, right? If I call that alpha, uh, then this is A, this is B, and this is 
C, right? And this is beta, and this is gamma. We don't care about beta. We don't care about gamma. They're totally irrelevant, aren't they? If, if all we're looking for is alpha, cosine alpha would be B squared plus C squared minus A squared over 2BC. So alpha is cosine inverse of this stuff. I know what A, B, and C are. Those were all given, right? These would be alpha, right? So, so, I can call it alpha. so now that I know what alpha is, plug it in here and plug it in there, and now I know what my X and Y are. Right, I make it look easy, right? They give you this triangle. They give you the three sides, but what you want is C sides, right? That's what you're looking for. So they give you the big triangle. You know those three sides. If you could just figure out that angle, then you could figure out what these are because that's the hypotenuse to this red right triangle, all right? I mean, you could start being like, it's the law of cosine section. I'm just going to start solving stuff. You could figure out what gamma is, what beta is, and then you still look at it and you still don't know what these are, right? So if you just like start randomly applying stuff, yeah, you could figure that out, but it's not going to help. The first thing you're going to have to do is like, if I need to find this coordinate, that's a right triangle. How do I get this side and that side? Well, you want to look at it. I can get this angle from the big triangle. This angle is the angle that's shared between this one and the big one, right? This is part of both triangles. This is part of both triangles. Use those two pieces of information, right? This is only part of the big triangle. This is only part of the big triangle. Focus on what's shared between your two triangles whenever you're doing word problems and stuff like that, right? That's that's where the meat is. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. This guy came from the law of cosine. A squared equals B squared plus C squared minus 2BC cosine alpha. This was your law of cosine. If you just solve for this, you get this, okay? Like, I never remember this. I might remember that, right? I remember it's the Pythagorean theorem and then minus this, you know? But since the A, Bs, and Cs are arbitrary, you can write it however you want, as long as this is the angle opposite that thing, and these two guys are the same as those, then that's the law of cosine. From there, I have to like actually, you know, rearrange it on paper to get the right version of it. Okay, I only remember it because I just popped this twice in a row back to back. Like uh, the next thing we're going to do is Heron's area formula. Remember, I mentioned that last time. I was like, why well, isn't it in the book? Well, it's in this section. I can't remember the area formula that we figured out last time. I'd have to rederive it. I don't remember these formulas off the top of my head. I derived them. Okay, so maybe there's another problem. See, there's the big triangle, and then they're like, no, it's the little triangle. The shared information is that side and that angle. Once you get that angle, the X and the Y come right out. Okay. We've already done this one. This is the one they gave us at the beginning of a, a class. So here we go, Heron's area formula. I gave this to y'all last time because I thought it was cool. I already explained why it's cool, right? Uh, a, B, and C are the sides of the triangle. S is half the perimeter. The perimeter is the distance around the triangle, right? Add up the sides, divide by two, and you plug those in. And again, what makes this amazing is that, again, if you have a, a like X, to the second power, we don't say x to the second power, right? We say x squared. Because if x is a length, a length times a length is literally a square area, right? And if we have something to the third power, we don't say to the third power, we say cubed. 
because if x is a length, you have a length times a length times a length that literally is physically a volume. They're literally physically cubes they are talking about. And that's how people thought 2,000 years ago. So if you had a length times a length times a length times a length, a length to the fourth power, we don't have a name for something to the fourth power. We just say to the fourth power, right? So this dude coming up with this 2,000 years ago, going into the fourth dimension, there was no such thing as a fourth dimension, right? That wasn't something you could visualize or touch. Right, the fact that he went into four dimensions, square rooted it to get two dimensions, which is an area, is amazing. Okay, especially because this guy was alive around the year 40. 40. I mean, that doesn't even sound like a year, right? Sounds like an age of a middle aged man, right? 40, right? And I told you he did lots of cool stuff. So I did a quick uh, Google on him. Some of the things that he invented, all right. In the year of oh, 60 AD, all right, Heron, he's also known as Hero of Alexandria, all right, greatest uh, experimenter of antiquity. He, he invented the uh, steam powered engine, he invented the windmill. Yeah, the windmill, right, to harness like wind power. He turned a windmill, he made a, a in the church, he made an organ that played itself in the church. So. Imagine this is the year, what, 60? Like the first uh, book of the Bible was written like 100 years after Jesus was born, right? So this is like, this is a church. This is like proto-Christianity, right? This is how you get a religion going. You get the smartest man that's ever lived to create organs that play themselves. He also invented the first vending machine. Literally, you put a coin in this, this mechanical contraption and it would sell you holy water. Yeah, that's how you get a religion started right there, right? He had a, a other a steam engine would open the doors automatically to the church. So, I mean, if you show up, you're seeing literal miracles. You're going to be giving that church all your money because you want to go to heaven, okay? So I, I guess this is before the Catholic Church because it took a while for that to develop. I mean, this is like the year 60, right? If the first book of the Bible wasn't written for like another 100 years, there was like, there was no Catholic Church yet. Catholic means universal, universal Christian. So I'm trying to imagine like what were these people's actual religion? You know what I mean? It had to have been some kind of, if they had holy water, Right, it had to been some kind of proto-Christian uh, religion on the fly here. He invented the thermometer and the syringe. You know, he's like uh, his early automated devices uh, uh, represent some of the first formal research into cybernetics. Pretty awesome for the year sixty. <laughs> right. He invented uh, mechanisms for Greek theater, including an entirely mechanical play, almost 10 minutes in length, powered by a binary-like system of ropes, knots, and simple machines operated by a rotating cylindrical cogwheel. The sound of thunder was produced by the mechanically timed dropping of metal balls onto a hidden drum. As uh, so you walk into church, and things are just moving and playing, like God is there, you know? Hell yeah. Pretty awesome. A standalone fountain that operates under self-contained hydrostatic energy now called Heron's Fountain. <laughs> so just a few of the things he did. All of his writings were lost though. All right, this is Heron of Alexandria in uh, Egypt, uh, probably because the Christians burned down the library of Alexandria in the year 400 or so. That was a big loss. But I mean, really, people talk about that as like as a big deal. But a lot of the writings in that library were actually duplicates. There are other bigger, more amazing libraries around the world that were also thrown down by Christians. But, <laughs> you know, it's not necessarily on purpose, right? It's just kind of part of a war. Um, Hypatia of Alexandria, the first female curator of the Library of Alexandria. He was a genius mathematician as well. Uh, saint Clausius had her murdered. Of course, they made him a saint after he had her murdered. But anyhow, 
history. History is so boring. Like if you look at it from like the point of war, view of war, which is normally taught, like this people killed those people, and then these people attacked those people, and it's a list of dates of like mass murders. You know what I mean? If you if you back up and you look at history from the point of view of science or mathematical development, it's way more interesting and insightful. And you get the whole war thing out of it too, because like whoever had the best technology was the ones that were conquering. And the people with the best technology had the best mathematicians. So you get all that like for free, right? So uh, let's look at an example here. How hard can this be? Thanks to Heron of Alexandria, if we have three sides of a triangle, well, the area is easy, right? Half the perimeter would be, let's see, A plus B plus C. That's half the perimeter. 25 and 7 is 32 divided by 2 is 16. So the area is S times S minus A times S minus B times S minus C. Boom, plug that in your calculator, you have the area. There's nothing to do here. There's no math. He did all the math for us. Right, 2,000 years ago. Right, aren't we privileged? So we're like, I hate math. Well, at least we had people who did all the math for us. So literally, they figured the math out for us. Now all we have to do is like plug it into the computers correctly. And we're like, I don't want to have to plug it into the computer correctly, right? We'll give it a couple, you know, thousand more years, and we'll just have like, you know, this information in the cloud, and we'll have like a little antenna, and you'll just know everything without having to learn anything. But somebody's gonna have to figure out how to do that. I hate trying to explain to my algebra students, why should I have to learn this? It's like, look at everything around you. Somebody had to figure all that out, you know? At least you could do is learn like fifth grade math. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, so you can appreciate what people have gone through in order to make cars and electronics and video games and, you know, medical care. <laughs> that's a lot of work I mean, without knowing basic algebra it's like how can you look around and appreciate anything you know all right so here's three sides plug them in y'all can do that right i don't have to like point it this is how you plug a number into a formula y'all know how to do that by now all right we're done we're going to get out of here early today uh because that's the end of the section